What's up, everyone? It's good to see you. Let's stand and sing together. Here we go. As I reflect, I find perspective. There in the best and worst days of this life. You were always on my side. You're in the pain, you're in the promise. And on the days the furthest finds my faith. You're the fourth within the flames. I'm not alone. You said what the future is. Cause if the past can talk, it will tell me this. My God.
to remain standing you know this week I was thinking about all the ways that God has been working in and through our church just the ways that I know about and I started to to jot those things down and it didn't take me long before I had several pages that were that were filled up and it, it reminded me that it's not because of what we've done but because of who he is and in case you needed a reminder you didn't know this already God has been on the move and nothing paints this picture better than what just took place a couple weekends ago on Easter weekend. You know, just here at our Peoria campus, we saw 442 people get baptized in one weekend. It was, it was unbelievable. Every single one of those, those, that number is, there's a name and there's a story. And I wish we could hear all the stories because I heard some amazing God stories that weekend. There's a husband and wife who, who went, decided to go all in for Jesus and get baptized primarily because of the influence of their two teenage kids who were sold out for Jesus. They impacted them. It's amazing. I talked to so many people who, who, who didn't even think God would accept them because of their past and the shame that they'd been living in and they released it and accepted the free gift that he gave. I, there's a husband and wife who, who were on the brink of divorce. They actually had divorce papers drawn up and that weekend they decided to go all in for Jesus and they ripped the divorce papers up and a family had been redeemed because God stepped in. You know what's, a, what's the theme through all of the stories though? Is that God wants to meet you right where you're at. See, we don't worship a God who's far off and distant, but one who's active and moving in our midst. And you might have a hard time finding God in the midst of your circumstances or even praising him because of what you're going through. But just because he's not answering your prayers the way you want him to or in the timing you want, doesn't mean that God is not on the move. And maybe what you need today is just to chase after him and watch what he does. Because if you're here today, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what circumstance you find yourself in today, here's what I know. If you're here or you're watching this, God's not done with you yet. He's not done with your circumstance. There's reason to hope. There's reason to pray. Man, there's reason to praise him for who he is. And as we get ready to sing another song before we take communion together, we're just reminded that God just doesn't reside in a church room, but he wants to meet you right where you're at, right in the midst of your circumstance. Because wherever God's presence is, that place is a house of miracles. Where broken things get healed, man, and where hopelessness finds purpose. This place right now, it's a house of miracles, so let's continue to worship together. This is a house of worship. This is a place of praise. Where every demon trembles. Where we proclaim your name. Yes, we do. This is a house of healing. Let's lift it up, sing. So come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. We bring everything to the feet of Jesus. Everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. This resurrection. Set 
and defeating sin so we don't have to stand in the midst of our brokenness any longer. We can claim hope through the power of the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. The anxiety that binds us, the worry, the doubt, the fear, we can let that go in the name of Jesus because of what he's already accomplished miraculously through what it is that you did through him. We don't stand as defeated people, we stand as victorious people because of the miracle that you did through Jesus. We stand in a house of miracles because of what you've accomplished. And we continue to worship you right now through communion. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you through communion now. Amen.
still believe you're working I still believe you're speaking God, I believe you're working All things for good, yes I do So I fix my eyes on heaven God, I receive your vision God, I believe you're working All things for good Can we sing that together? I still believe you're moving I still believe you're speaking God, I believe you're working All things for good Let's make this our declaration I fix my eyes on heaven God, I receive your vision Pray God, I believe you're working We believe it He's working it all for his good Come on, declare it I still believe can uh, have a seat. Isn't it good to be a part of a church where God's moving? I mean, God's moving all around us, and I just, I, I just pinch myself at what we're seeing sometimes. Um, next weekend, I want to let you know, is Mother's Day. We have some really fun things planned for moms. You, you don't want to miss it. And moms, I just want to tell you, if you've had a hard time getting your kids or family to church, it's your perfect opportunity. All you have to do is tell them, that when they say, what do you want for Mother's Day? You say, to come to church with me. It's like, that's your cue, right? So it's going to be a really great weekend. This weekend, we're continuing our series, Letters from My Future Self. And the whole idea is if you could go back in time and write a letter to that younger, dumber version of yourself, like what would you say? And I shared some fun letters I, I would tell myself last weekend. One of them was, I'd say, man, don't ever get on stage at that Cirque du Soleil show because you're going to get your pants pulled down in front of 2,000 people including your future wife and in-laws. If you were here, you remember that story. And what's amazing is this week I got into the office and I got this email from a man named Mark who attends one of our campuses, and he said this. He said, Ashley, in September of 1997, my best friend and wife asked us to take a trip to Las Vegas. <laughs> On our second night, we went to this Cirque du Soleil show. Now, it's not what you think. It wasn't the same show I was at, okay? Okay. He keeps going. He said, we sat on the second row during intermission. This little fat baby walked on stage and pointed a spotlight at me and tried to get me on stage. And I resisted and I resisted. And my friends and my wife pushed me up on stage. And I went and I was up on stage. And the next thing I know, I was de-pants down to my boxers in front of everyone. He said, I've never been that embarrassed in my life. He said, I don't even know how it happened. For years, I've tried to share that story and nobody believed me. And finally, I learned last weekend that there's someone that understands my pain. You know, so Mark and I have started a support group. Um, we, we think there's more of you out there that may have experienced this. But uh, can I share a couple more fun things I'd tell myself if I could go back in time? Uh, here's, here's one. I'd say, Ashley, I know you've grown up in Arizona your entire life. You haven't seen a lick of snow. But trust me, one day you are going to need to know not only what a snowblower is, but you need to know how much it costs. <laughs> Ashley, you're going to be on the prices right during college. You're going to go crazy when they call you down stage, okay? <laughs> you're going to go nuts. And you will never get off contestants row if you don't know how much a snowblower costs. And listen to me, Ashley, it doesn't cost $1,200. That's what you bid, you idiot, okay? <laughs> Repeat after me, a snowblower cost 
$579. Okay, if I would just have known that, I'd just have known that. Here's something else I would tell myself. Ashley, as you transition into adulthood, you want to be viewed as self-sufficient and strong, and you will rarely ask for help. This is a massive mistake. In the year 2000, you're going to buy your first home. Within months, you'll be doing a repair upstairs, and you'll break a main water line. Water will gush out and flood your entire upstairs. You'll try to fix it. 50 minutes later, it's still gushing. It begins seeping down the ceilings and begins to flood your downstairs as well. In your pride, you just try to fix it on your own. Finally, you humble yourself and walk across the street and ask your neighbor for help. In 90 seconds, an older, wiser man fixes the issue. Ashley, ask for help sooner. It'll save you thousands of dollars and will teach you a lesson that asking for help does not make you weak. It is the strongest thing you can do. Any, anybody else struggle asking for help a little bit? If, if, if I was going to write myself a letter, last week I, t- I told you I would write myself a letter, don't worry so much. But, but at the top of the list of letters I would write myself, because I struggled with this so bad, and I feel like I still do, I would tell myself, Ashley, ask for help. And I'm not just talking about asking for help from God. I, I feel like a lot of us do that. We cry out, God, help me, help me. I mean asking for help from the people that God has placed around you, godly people around you. And I'd be embarrassed. I mean, crazy embarrassed to tell you the number of mistakes I've made in my life because I just wouldn't ask. I just wouldn't ask. I wonder who else struggles here. Like, do, do you struggle walking into Home Depot and asking for help? You struggle asking for help at work, at school, with future decisions, with your finances, with your parenting, with an addiction, with a relationship, with a marriage. Now, pop quiz. Everybody's got to play. Who struggles more asking for help? What does every study say, men or women? I'm going to ask you to vote. How many think women? Raise your hand. Hi, women struggle more. How many think men struggle more? Every study says women struggle more. I'm just kidding. It's not not women at all. Of course, you already knew. Like, you knew men struggle more, right? In fact, this, this week I read an article. It was so funny. This article, there's a new phrase they're using kind of in research. And here's the phrase they're using. Male answer syndrome. Do you want to know what male answer syndrome is? It's when a man doesn't know the answer. Instead of saying, I don't know, he just starts talking like he does. Like, I've done that. Instead of just being like a simple, you know, I don't know the answer to that. It's like, well, you know, back in 19... No, you don't even know. Just say it. Hey, this isn't a male problem, though. It's, it's an everybody problem, right? As, as we get started, let me just ask. Why is it so hard for some of us to simply ask for help? And underneath this is one root issue. Remember last week I said that the issue behind our worry and anxiety is the idea of control. And the more you want control, the more you'll shake with anxiety. But underneath the idea of not asking for help is pride. It's our pride. It's simply the idea that if I ask for help, maybe that makes me look weak, needy, or incompetent. Proverbs 13.10 Where there is strife, there is pride. Now let that sink in for a minute. Almost any place in your life today that there's strife, there's issues, there's division, there's pain, beneath it is your pride, my pride. What is the answer? But wisdom is found in those who what? Say it out loud. Take advice. Those who take advice. I wrote in my notes, when it comes to asking for help, our desire to be viewed as Superman has become our kryptonite. I mean, come on. How how many of you growing up, like, you know how you you have heroes? How many of you growing up pretended to be shaggy on Scooby-Doo? Anybody out there? You're like, yeah, I wanted to be shaggy. Why didn't you want to be shaggy? Because look at him. The dude's weak. Nobody wants to be that guy. Now, guys, how many of you grew up like, loving or wanting to be like Superman. 
Yeah, almost all of us, right? You had the underoos with Superman on them, right? <laughs> Superman never asked for help. He didn't need help. Superman's not real. There's a story of Muhammad Ali, and he was on an airplane, and the flight attendant, and Muhammad Ali, not, not known for his humility, on an airplane, didn't have a seatbelt buckled, and the flight attendant looked at him and said, Mr. Ali, you need to buckle your seatbelt immediately. And he looked at her and he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. To which she replied, Superman don't need no plane either. <laughs> See, uh, our desire to be viewed as strong in Superman is a, is, is a form of kryptonite and weakness in our life. And what, what many of us need to do is we need to reorient our minds that asking for help isn't weak. It may be the strongest thing you do. And I want to show that to you by just starting off by looking at one of my favorite Proverbs. I mean, I quote this proverb probably more than any other proverb to my kids and other people. And here's what it says in Proverbs 15, 22. Plans fail for lack of advice. Now, the word plans in Hebrew just means your goals, your desires, your future plans. So just think right now, like, what do you want for your future? What desires do you have? They will fail straight out with the lack of advice. But many advisors bring success. I love that. Now, the, the word advisors in Proverbs 15, 22 comes from this root Hebrew word that means to consult or get advice. And what I want to do today is I want to take you to the first time in Scripture that Hebrew word is used. It's used 80 times, and this is the first time it's ever used in Exodus chapter 18. And it's, it's an amazing case study to me of a person that almost failed to take advice and almost ruined himself and everyone around him. And it is really the story of the early leadership of Moses. Now, if you know anything about Moses, Moses led the people uh, of Israel out of slavery. They'd been in for 40 years out of Egypt, and, he, and God chose him to take the people out. And what you need to about, know about Moses, he was really this weak, reluctant leader at the beginning. I mean, he was viewed as weak. Everyone kind of saw him as weak. He made all sorts of excuses. But at this point in his life, what's happened is he has experienced some success. I mean, God has just led the people out of Egypt. He's parted the Red Sea. I mean, Moses was like, Moses is the man at this point. And here's my hunch. In Moses' desire to look strong, he won't really operate and ask for help. And you're going to see that. And God's going to send someone to teach him about asking for help. Now, if you don't think the Bible has humor or that God has a sense of humor, I, I promise you he does. And here's, a, here's all, I would just give you this example today, and I was just cracking up in my office studying this this week. Do you know who God sent to Moses to teach him about asking for help? Moses' father-in-law. Just, that just makes me laugh, because for most guys here, especially like early on in marriage and life, who's the last person you want to ask for help from? Your father-in-law, your wife's like, honey, just call my dad. Call my dad, he'll help. They're like, pipe down, woman, I'm not calling your dad. <laughs> right? And God sends Moses' father-in-law to teach him, which means if he can learn it, anybody can. All right, let's pick up. Uh, Exodus chapter 18, starting in verse 7, it says this. So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law. His father-in-law shows up on the scene and, and he bowed down and kissed him, and he, he greeted each other, and then they went into the tent. Now, this is just them kind of exchanging pleasantries, kind of like if your father-in-law came over to the house, and you were like, hey, what's going on? And then your father-in-law's like, hey, let's go to the garage, talk man to man. So, they, so Moses, with his father-in-law, went into the tent. Now, you can kind of just picture like his father-in-law going like, hey, Moses, like, tell me how it's really going, because his father-in-law hasn't been around Moses since they, they've led him out of Egypt, and so... You know, Moses goes on. So what's Moses do? Next verse. Moses told his father-in-law about everything the Lord had done. Now, we don't know exactly what Moses said, but could you just imagine Moses being like, yeah, you know, we, Pharaoh said no. And I was like, oh, yeah, bam. 
God delivers us out and parted the Red Seas. Everyone was scared, and I was like, let's go. And now I'm leading over a million people. There's a million, there was a million people Moses led out of Egypt. And you can tell him looking at his father-in-law and going like, you probably never thought your son-in-law would be leading a million people, did you? But here I am. Your daughter's pretty lucky. <laughs> now, I'm sure his father-in-law was impressed. I mean, what God was doing through Moses' life was amazing. And who knows, maybe his father-in-law said, hey, Moses, do you, do you need any help at all? Moses is like, oh, please look at me. Verse 13, the next day, the very next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around him from, mo from morning until evening. Now just understand the context. There's a million people. With a million people means there's a million problems. So who's gonna fix all the people's problems? Moses decides he's the only one to do it. Sets himself up as judge and from morning till evening, you think you have long days? From morning sunrise till sunset, Moses is up there judging everybody's problems because he's the man. Doesn't ask for any help, doesn't ask for anybody to get involved, doesn't ask for anybody's advice. It's just, just Moses, him alone. So verse 14, next verse, his father-in-law, observing this, asked Moses a very simple question. Hey, Moses, why do you alone sit as judge? Like, why, why are you doing it by yourself? While all these people stand around you from morning till evening. Like, Moses, why on earth wouldn't you ask for help? And what, I just want you to watch Moses' answer, because this is what I would call the leader's trap. It's anyone's trap. We all fall into this. Just Moses, very honestly, watch what Moses says. Moses answers and says, because the people come to me. Like, they're, they're coming to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me. I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions because look at me. Now look at the me, I language in that verse. It's all about me. I don't need anybody else. What Moses is saying is if the people come to me, I'm the one that should have all the answers. That is a crazy, limited way of thinking. Do you understand that just because people come to you for answers, you don't have to be the one that has the answers? I want to say that to someone else here, that, that maybe you're, you're a leader. I don't care if you're leading a small team. I don't care if you're leading an entire business. I don't care if you're leading as a mom at home with those little rascals running everywhere. When someone comes to you with a problem or a question, do you understand you don't have to be the one that has all the answers? That God has other people around you that he wants you to rely on to help? Do you know God never designed you to have all the answers? If you think that, can I tell you what will happen immediately in any area of your life? If you're the one that has to have all the answers and you won't ask for help, you will immediately become the bottleneck for your growth and everyone else's growth around you. You'll be the issue. And I, I, I've struggled here. I mean, I've had to learn. I've had to grow. I mean, I'll just use myself as an example here at CCV. I mean, imagine at CCV tomorrow, at our church, I set myself up like Moses did as like just the guy that has all the answers for every single thing at our church. Every, every question any person would have, any of our staff across 12 campuses, soon to be 15 campuses, every person, every person that ever attends our church, I am the single person point of contact for everything because I'm so good. Do you understand what would happen overnight to our church? First of all, I wouldn't preach another message of my life because from morning until evening, that's all I would do. I wouldn't study, I wouldn't teach, I wouldn't even lead at all. And what would happen overnight is our church would shrink and lose all of its effectiveness in reaching the valley for Christ because of my limited view. And by the way, the reason most churches in America are not growing, it is not a preaching issue, it's not a ministry issue, it's a leadership issue. 
The person at the top becomes a limiter because they won't ask for help. No leader was ever designed to be the end-all, be-all in any situation. And if you do that, you won't invite others to come alongside you and help you and ask for their help and ask for their advice. And that's why at CCV, I cannot tell you how thankful I am that we have such an incredible staff team. I mean, from our campus pastors to our associate pastors to our student pastors to our kids pastors, to our special needs pastors, to our stars pastors and volunteers. Do we not have one of the most incredible staffs on the planet at CCV? Yeah. I mean, I've got this amazing executive team. We have all these leaders all around here, but you know who the real heroes are around CCV? It's not our staff. It's our volunteers. It's those of you that step up every single week and lead And we've tried to empower our staff and our volunteers at CCV to go make a difference because that's the way it was designed to be. You were never designed at your work, in your family, in decision-making to just do it on your own, which is why what Moses' father-in-law says to him next is what someone came here this weekend to hear. Moses set him up, set himself up as like, I'm the guy, I don't need anybody else's help. And watch what Moses' father-in-law says next in verse 17. Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing, say it out loud, is not good. Say Say it out loud one more time. What you're doing is not good. To rely only on yourself is the worst decision you could ever make in your life. And self-sufficiency is a myth that is dictated by pride and temporary success. What you're doing, Moses, is not good. He goes on. He says, Moses, you and these people who come to you, you're just going to wear yourself out, which means what? If you try to do it on your own, watch this. When you won't ask for help, you don't just wear yourself out. You wear out everyone around you. There's a parent here today. The issues you're having with your kids, you're wearing your kids out because you're trying to do it on your own. You're wearing everybody else out. So Moses' father-in-law goes on and in the rest of verse 18, he says, the work's too heavy for you. You can't handle it alone. No area of life were you designed to handle it alone. Business, parenting, dating, marriage, addiction. Everything's too heavy. Verse 19, listen now to me and I'll give you some advice. And there we see the word advice used, that root word in Hebrew, for the very first time. And I'll challenge you to go read the rest of Exodus chapter 18 this week. But the advice Moses' father-in-law gives him is he says, Moses, don't stop leading. I'm not telling you to sit in a chair and do nothing. Keep leading, but ask for help. Surround yourself with people that you you can enable, capable men that you can surround yourself with and, and, and get some help. That's my advice. And I love what Moses' reply was, verse 24. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did what? Everything he said. And I like that because some of us listen to advice and then we do nothing with it. What did Moses do? He listened and he applied. And it changed everything everything for the nation of Israel, everything, to the point where we have structures and decision-making today based on this advice that we've used from Scripture even today. Now, again, Scripture has a ton of humor. And if you can't see this, I mean, I I don't know how to help you. But remember, Moses' father-in-law comes, shows up, gives him some advice, which is probably a little hard. And then the very end of chapter 18, this is just kind of free today, The end of chapter 18 ends with this verse. Then Moses sent his father-in-law on his way. (laughs) Is that good? Hey, sometimes the in-laws might overstay their welcome, and you're like, okay, now it's time. Okay, now it's time. Let's go. That's no knock. I have the greatest in-laws in the world, by the way. That's not speaking of my in-laws. I'm just saying there there can be in-law situations where you're like, okay, it's time. It's like nervous laughter in the room. You're sitting next to your in-laws. Not with us. We love you. No, it's like, I mean, just humor, right? What can we learn from Exodus chapter 18 about getting advice, asking for help? 
I want to give you three things today. The third one I'm going to dive a little deeper on. If you're taking notes today, I hope you are. Here's number one. You may be one piece of advice away from a better future. You may be one piece of advice away from a better future. Here's what I know. Every issue you have in your life right now, God is waiting to provide you an answer. And you say, well, why doesn't he just tell me? Why doesn't God just tell me? Listen, God sometimes does. He'll, he'll speak to you clearly through his word. He'll speak to you clearly through prayer oftentimes. But do you know that God designed you to go ask other people for help? When Adam was all alone in the Garden of Eden, what is the first thing God did when he saw Adam all alone? He made him a helpmate. You were designed to go ask others for advice. And if it was just you and God all the time, do you know what you'd do? You'd think you were a bigger deal than you were. You'd get all self-sufficient and you wouldn't rely on other people. And I'm just telling you, whatever you're dealing with today, if you would engage someone around you that God has placed that is godly, you're one piece of, you're one piece of advice away. One piece of advice away from your future changing forever. Here's number two. Asking for help isn't admitting failure. It's, it's pursuing success. Moses Getting this help and advice and accepting it, that didn't make him weak. That led to his success. And I would just tell you, in, in my life, the most successful people I know are the people that ask for advice the most. The people I see struggling the most, I mean just really struggling, are the people that are only trying to rely on themselves. I'll give you an example. In, in our church, there, there's a, a CEO I know pretty well, and he leads a very large company. I'm, I mean, just to put it in context, it's a company that has a revenue of $550 million, and he's responsible, right? Thousands of employees. And I've been around him enough to know this. I've hardly seen anybody in my life that will ask for more advice than him from tons of people. And here's the thing. He's not young. He's in his sixties. I mean, you, you think like when you get in your sixties, like I kind of know it all. No, you never stop asking for advice. And he's in his sixties, but he comes across so young to me. And I think one of the reasons why is because he's so young because he'll ask advice from anybody. And he's amazing at it. Are, are you holding back? Cause you think it makes you weak. Here's the last thing I'd say. The quality of the people you surround yourself with will determine the quality of the advice you, you get. It's been said, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. Hey, the quality of the people that are around you right now will dictate the quality of the advice you get. And of all the things we'll cover today, this is the one that worries me the most for most people. Let me put it this way. There's not one person here today that's not getting advice. And some of you are thinking this. Finally, he said it. Like he's been talking about advice. I get advice all the time. Like I get advice from Siri, Alexa, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. I mean, if I need advice like TikTok, I just go on there and I just scroll until something hits me. Oh, I'm getting tons of advice. Now, I don't go to another person because that makes me look weak, but in my own room, in the dark, I look at a screen and I'm just like, what should I do? Everyone's getting advice. The question is, what's the quality of your advice? And is it coming from another human being that's quality. And I want to give you five requirements. These are my own requirements. I just want to lay them at your feet, okay? These are requirements I use in my own life if I'm going to go get advice. And I think they would serve many of you really, really well, right? Here's requirement number one. Make it a follower of Jesus. It sounds so simple, but make it a follower of Jesus. Now listen, we're not being like legalistic about this. Like I, if, if a doctor or the person at Home Depot is not a Christian, that's okay, right? I can get something from you. But anything that matters in my life, 
I'm going to ask another follower of Jesus. Why? Because I want the values to match. And where I see people get the worst advice that leads them astray is when you get advice from someone whose values don't match your values as a follower of Jesus. So make it a follower of Jesus. Here's, here's number two. Choose experience over influence. What blows my mind is the number of people I watch get advice from influencers in our society that have little experience. Just because someone is a celebrity does not mean they are wise in God's eyes. Let me say that again for somebody. Just because someone wrote a song or has a million followers on social media doesn't mean jack in terms of the wisdom they can give you. It doesn't. I don't care how many followers you have. I care about the number of years of experience down a road that I would potentially want to be down. That's what I care about. Do you, do you want to know why? Why? I didn't get on the prices right. Honestly. And this is honest truth. I've shared this before. I want to share it again. The reason I stand right now and I stood on contestants row the whole entire show is every item I bid on, I turned around and asked my 19-year-old stupid peers what I should bid. <laughs> I'm serious. They had influence in my life. They were my buddies. They were my friends. I was like, what do you think? You've never bought a snowblower in your life. What should I bid? I mean, how stupid is that? I should have scanned the audience and been like, who looks, who has some experience? Sir, have you bought a snowblower? Thank you. Okay, what should, I mean, I'm so off. And I'm just telling you, some of you here today, all you do is ask your peers advice. And you will never, ever get to where you want to go until you start asking people that are already way down that road. If you're dating here today and you want to know, are they the one? Stop asking your friends and peers. You ask someone who's been married for 20 to 30 years that's way down the road and has a strong marriage. Doesn't that just sound so obvious? And yet we don't do it. You have a financial issue. Man, ask the strongest financially like grounded people you know that are way down the road and have made tons of, of great decisions and maybe even some mistakes along the way. You have an addiction. Ask someone who's to come alongside you that actually has overcome an addiction, not just someone who's read about it. Hey, uh, this is just my advice. You want to choose experience over influence all day long. Here's number three. Ask people that know you the best and love you the most. Ask people that know you the best. Why? So you don't try to steamroll them with your excuses. You go to someone who doesn't know you, and you'll give them any story, and they don't even know if they, they could call, like, bull on you, right? Ask someone that knows you, and ask someone that loves you the most. And this is really practical, because it's hard to take advice from people that you know don't love you, very practically. And my guess is there's someone here today, and you're, you're a little upset because you actually have a lot of wisdom, you have a lot of experience, but people don't ask you for your advice much. And I just want to challenge you that, that maybe people don't ask for your advice because you are not a loving, caring person. It is hard to go ask for advice from someone that you know doesn't actually care for you. Ask someone that knows you the best, loves you the most. That's, that's going to be good advice. Here's number four. Ask more than one person. Oh, this one's so big. Watch what Proverbs 15, 22 says again. This is so gold. This is the wisest man on earth that wrote this. Plans fail for lack of advice, but with, say it out loud, many advice. Oh, what, like one, one person, ask one person. You know why we ask one person so many times? We ask the one person we know will already agree with what we already want to do. That's what we do. Sometimes we don't ask multiple people because we think, well, I don't want to be a burden on people. No, you're not going to be a burden. Oftentimes you'll be a blessing 
Now, you can be codependent. You can be a little needy in some situations. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about ask just scripture. Forget your opinion. God says ask multiple advisors for success. Here's the last one, and this one's going to sting, but it's good. Ask someone who's likely to disagree with you. Now make sure they're godly, make sure they know you, but you ask someone who's likely to disagree with you, and here's why. We have a tendency just to go to people that we know align with, with what we're already thinking. It's a, it's a human tendency. What every leader here knows is that some of the best advice you've gotten, some of the best input you've gotten is from people that don't always see it the way you see it. And I'm telling you, this is an immaturity thing if you struggle doing this. A mature leader surrounds himself with people that give input that doesn't always align with what you think. I'll tell you, Jamie and I last year, just very personally, in our personal life, we, we kind of had a big decision to make. And in making that decision, we decided to ask a married couple that's ahead of us their advice, and we specifically asked them because we thought they would disagree with where we were already leaning. And let me tell you, that advice was some of the best advice we got. Don't you dare just go to people that are automatically gonna agree with you. You go to people that are gonna push your assumptions. That's wise. So let me ask. Where do you need some advice? Like what, what area of your life right now do you need some help in? I don't know what it would be for you. It might be a marriage. It might be finances. It might be your parenting. It might be a big future decision. Can I pry with you? Because you know how we roll here. I'm not just going to let you out of here without really trying to apply this to your life. I love you too much to do that. Some of you have a future decision and you are one piece of advice away from that being a successful decision. You better ask. Some of you have an addiction and it's hidden and you're embarrassed and you're not asking for help. And I'm gonna challenge you today. God's calling you out. Get some help. Get some help. Some of you parents have a kid and you would ship them to another country tomorrow if it wasn't like illegal, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's tough on you right now and you're just trying to do it on your own. Here's what I know. There's a parent in this service right now at your campus that has an answer for the issues you're going through. But you gotta ask. I know for sure there's parents in our CCV groups that would come alongside and give you amazing advice. You'd say, well, I don't have time. You keep talking about groups. I don't have time for a group. I got kids and activities. Really? You think one hour being in a group and getting the advice you need might save you five to 10 hours of issues you deal with every single week? You see what's at stake? Some of you have a marriage and a relationship and it's hurting because marriages are hurting everywhere. You're not the only one, okay? You're not alone. I have a friend of mine who was a professional athlete, very good professional athlete. His marriage was hurting. I asked him, I said, hey, you ever been really, really injured when you were playing professionally, like a, a physical injury? He said, oh, multiple times. This is bad injury and this was nasty. So that's awesome. Did, did you ever try to rehab it on your own? I said, no, that would be stupid. I mean, I went to the best. There are some hurts in your marriage that you will never overcome unless you get help and advice and godly couples in this church that want to come alongside you or go to counseling. Stop doing it alone. Listen. You can't go back and write yourself a letter. You can't. You can ask for help 
today. And remember, you may be one piece of advice away from a better future. Amen. Dear younger me, I know how hard you try to keep it all afloat. You feel responsible for so much and you work so hard not to let it show. Some days that resiliency and drive is your greatest feat. But I'm here to remind you that it's not the only option. Just look around. God has surrounded you with people who have your back. It's not a weakness to ask for help when you need it. In fact, sometimes that moment of vulnerability is the strongest, bravest thing you could do. It means you're human and God designed us to need each other. So take it from me. It's time to get off the island. Let go of the ego and the pride. Trust instead in a God that's led you through so much already. And don't be afraid to ask for help. There's wind at your back, friends in your corner, and Christ at your center. Does anybody else feel convicted like me right now? I think we all, we all can struggle with this, but we need to know that sometimes the strongest thing you can do is ask somebody else for help. If you're wondering, man, I, I don't have anybody to, to ask for help from, I don't even know where to go. We, we would love to have a conversation with you, whether you're here on campus or you're joining us online, you can type something in the chat. If you're here on campus, you can go out to our guest services tent. We, we would love to connect with you and help you take your next step. But all of us are likely are one piece of advice away from, from a better life. That's just the truth. Let me close this in prayer. Father, thank you for the truth of your word and for convicting us and reminding us that, that you didn't design us to do this life alone. Lord, give us the boldness and the strength to, to make ourselves better by asking other people to join us on our journey, to ask other people for advice and for help. We know there's strength in that, so give us the boldness to do that as we leave here today. We love you, it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, don't forget next week's Mother's Day. Have a great week, God bless you. I'll see you back here next week.